Well, between now and Tuesday, November 5th, the two most important stories we will be covering at this hour are the multiple prosecutions of criminal defendant Donald Trump and the presidential election. There are, of course, obviously, hugely important stories going on at the same time around the world, in Ukraine, in Gaza and Israel and elsewhere around the world, in Africa, Asia, South America. But the presidential election is the most important of all of those stories because what happens in all of those other stories around the world after November 5th largely depends on who wins the election. If Donald Trump wins the election, the Israeli government and the Israeli military will be free to, as Donald Trump puts it, finish the job in Gaza. Those are Trump's words, finish the job. He means kill as many people as you want to. Donald Trump will not try to achieve a ceasefire the way President Biden has been working to achieve a ceasefire. And in Ukraine, if Donald Trump wins the election, Vladimir Putin will be free to continue to kill Ukrainians in his imperialistic march to take over Ukraine without any resistance at all from the American president. And if Donald Trump is elected president, the story of criminal defendant Trump in effect disappears. Donald Trump would be able to end both federal prosecutions against him by Special Prosecutor Jack Smith, who would be instantly fired by Donald Trump, and the two state prosecutions against him in New York and Georgia would be forced into at least a four-year delay until Donald Trump is no longer president. If Donald Trump wins, then justice loses. If Donald Trump wins, human decency loses. If Donald Trump wins, then all is lost. And as of tonight, most American voters know that. Joe Biden is going to win millions more votes than Donald Trump. But this is the country where you can come in second with the voters and still become president, still win. Thanks to the perversion of democracy, the founders called the Electoral College. And as of tonight, not enough people in a handful of so-called battleground states who will decide this election understand the stakes of this election. Not enough people in those few states yet understand what they will lose if Donald Trump wins. And so we begin tonight with what is now the most important of those stories that we will be covering this year because it will determine the outcome of the rest of those stories. If we begin with the presidential election, and last night's presidential primaries, Joe Biden was the first to win enough delegates to secure the Democratic nomination for president. Hours later, Donald Trump won enough delegates to secure the Republican nomination for president. And today, President Biden continued his campaigning in battleground states, appearing at the opening of the Biden-Harris Wisconsin Coordinated Campaign Headquarters in Milwaukee, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel notes, it's the first Milwaukee campaign base for a Democratic presidential nominee in at least 20 years. The Biden-Harris campaign is opening 43 other campaign offices in Wisconsin, all over the state. Here's President Biden speaking at the Wisconsin campaign headquarters in Milwaukee today. Our freedoms are at stake. Uh, they really are at stake, not a joke. The right to choose, the right to be able to determine whether you're going to get to vote, how we vote. Uh, it's all in your hands. And you folks like you all across the country, because this is how I won the first time I ever ran. This is how we're going to win again. A lot of you helped me in 2020, and we make sure he was a loser. He is a loser. <laughs> and we're going to make sure that happens again, right? At a campaign event in Milwaukee, the president explained what his infrastructure bill means for daily life. I mean, wider sidewalks for children walking to school, safer bike lanes for residents and visitors, dedicated bus lanes to get work to get to work faster, new new trees to provide shade, modern infrastructure to prevent sewage from flowing into the Milwaukee River and the Lake Michigan. These are life changing improvements. 
They're also going to make it easy for historic black communities in the North and Latino communities in the South to access jobs, school, and entertainment. Opportunities in the city and central hub, from watching the Milwaukee Bucks play to attending Milwaukee Area Technical College. My predecessor talked about infrastructure week for four years. He didn't get a single thing done, not one. Ron Johnson, every Republican in Congress, voted against the Inflation Reduction Act, which is helping fund these projects, and he wants to repeal it. President Biden explained some of what is at stake on the presidential ballot. Just this week, Donald Trump said cuts to Social Security and Medicare are on the table. Instead of cutting Social Security and Medicare to give tax breaks to the super wealthy, I'm going to protect and strengthen Social Security and Medicare to make the wealthy begin to pay their fair share. Keep this number in mind. Joe Biden won Georgia by just 11,779 votes in 2020. And on Election Day yesterday in Georgia, Nikki Haley won almost 20,000 votes. All of those voters knew that Nikki Haley had already dropped out of the presidential campaign. But still, yesterday on Election Day, 20,000 voters went to the polls in Georgia to vote in the presidential primary for Nikki Haley against Donald Trump. That is a sign of potential weakness for Donald Trump in November. Nikki Haley's total vote in Georgia was 77,000, which includes early votes cast before Nikki Haley dropped out of the presidential campaign. Today, the Biden-Harris campaign released this statement. Haley's voters continue to make it crystal clear that Donald Trump is not building a coalition that can win in November. Suburban, moderate and independent voters are rejecting Trump's divisive rhetoric and extreme policies. And it's no surprise Donald Trump is running on the same extreme MAGA agenda that has cost Republicans election after election, threatening democracy, overturning Roe passing a national abortion ban, repealing the Affordable Care Act, and cutting Medicare and Social Security. When Ben Wickler talks Wisconsin, I just listen. Tell me what we need to know about this kind of historic and important Democratic campaign investment in, in Wisconsin. So... President Biden was uh, in Wisconsin. I think it was his sixth visit today. Um, and uh, Kamala Harris has been here five times. We are a constant focus because Wisconsin is the tipping point state. It's the state that tipped for Trump, the presidential election in 2016, for Biden in 2020, uh, for the last six presidential campaign uh, campaign uh, margins of victory here came down to less than one percentage point. The Biden-Harris administration knows this, and they're investing with their presence, with campaign resources, and ensuring that this presidency and this administration delivers for Wisconsin voters, as they're doing nationwide. So today, President Biden was here announcing a $35 million investment in the uh, 6th Street corridor in, in Milwaukee to ensure that where an interstate cut through and divided communities decades ago, they're now going to, to rebuild in a way that brings communities together. And then he came over to the campaign headquarters and basically opened up and connected with dozens of cheering volunteers and supporters, uh, had conversations, took selfies with them, the office that will be the heart of the statewide operation to make sure we both turn out and persuade every possible Biden-Harris voter, every voter who doesn't want a Trump dictatorship starting in 2025. Uh, the nerve center for this campaign is in Milwaukee because Republicans have targeted Milwaukee for voter suppression and they've bragged about it and we're going to fight back. Ben, uh, as you know, there is a tension uh, around this campaign. I remember in past presidential campaigns in the pre-Trump era, people would say to me, you know, what's going to happen as if I knew. And I would always tell them, I don't know. Uh, and, and now what what I hear from people is tell me it's going to be OK. Tell me it's going to be OK. Uh, it's very different from uh, the feelings that you had on uh, Democrat versus Republican presidential campaigns in the past. It's about uh, are we going to be OK? Is the country going to be OK? Are we going to get through this, which means uh, is Donald Trump uh, going to lose? Are we gonna, is, is that and, and uh, you know, what? Well, do you, what do you say when people ask you that in a state where it's a 1% one way or the other outcome? 
I say that Wisconsin over and over, and this is true in all the closest battleground states, it's going to come down to the margin of effort. In other words, the work that people do, volunteers who want to help us, go to wisdems.org. Uh, you can sign up to volunteer or to donate anywhere in the country. And people in Wisconsin knocking on doors, making those phone calls, chipping in, that will determine the outcome because it'll come down to two or three votes per precinct around our state. And the good thing about an incredibly small margin like that is that you can make the difference yourself. Watching this right now, you can play the role in flipping a precinct that helps flip the state that tips the entire electoral college. That is an extraordinary privilege. It's the power of being in, an, in a genuine democracy, and it's use it or lose it. This is the moment, if you care about our democracy, to fight for it. And the polls say in Wisconsin, it is tied. This could absolutely come down to a minuscule margin that, that volunteers, after we win the election and Joe Biden wins another term and we can all exhale, volunteers in this election will be able to look in the mirror and say to themselves, I did this. That's what we want for everyone to feel in this race. Ben Wickler, thank you very much for giving us that guidance. I know there's a lot of voters out there in states like California, New York, Massachusetts, other places where uh, they are out of the Electoral College game. They're, they're absolutely going to Joe Biden, and they only wish they could help somehow uh, in those states that have that, that burden and privilege and responsibility in the end of choosing a president. So that guidance is is very helpful beyond Wisconsin. Thank you very they much. They can call. They can join our virtual phone banks. Let me just say, we welcome folks from out of state. You'll call strong Democrats and remind them to vote. You don't. We don't want out of state volunteers doing the persuasion here. But uh, we can absolutely use all the volunteers anywhere in the country because there are. We had three point two eight million votes in twenty twenty. Uh, who knows how many we'll need this time? We're, we're bringing up the numbers now. We want help from anyone who can help because it's going to be. All hands on deck to win this thing. Ben, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. This week, the Biden-Harris campaign announced the endorsement of a coalition of 15 youth and Gen Z voter groups. The campaign also launched Students for Biden-Harris that will mobilize volunteers on more than a 1,000 college campuses nationwide. In 2020, President Biden carried voters under 30 by 24 points against Donald Trump. And young voters will obviously be a crucial voting bloc again this November. One recent poll found 72 percent of young voters say they are likely to vote in the 2024 election, with 57 percent of them saying they are extremely likely to vote. In the last election, young voters helped elect Congressman Maxwell Frost, the youngest member of Congress. Gun safety advocate and Parkland, Florida shooting survivor David Hogg was active in Maxwell Frost's campaign. After that, David Hogg founded an organization to support young candidates for office. David Hogg's organization, Leaders We Deserve, endorses young candidates to achieve more diversity and greater representation in state legislatures which remain majority male and majority white. Joining us now is David Hogg, president of Leaders We Deserve. With him are two candidates his organization has recently endorsed, Christine Cockley, and she is a candidate for a state house uh, representative in Ohio's 6th District, and Ashwan Ramaswamy. He is a candidate for a state Senate in Georgia's 48th district. David, let me begin with you and your choice in endorsing these two candidates. Well, they're incredible representations of all the best that our generation has to offer from Christine's work across Ohio to help, you know, bring the next generation into power and with the party and with Ashran's work to help secure our elections in 2020. Uh, and the fact that Ashran himself is running against a fake elector for Trump in one of the most competitive races in Georgia is significant because we have to show our generation we're not just voting on the outside, but we're getting representation on the inside to people who understand the anxiety of what it's like going through a school shooter drill. Because unfortunately, Biden does have a bit of a youth voter problem. Uh, and we part of our hope with this work is to show young people that there are many people uh, on the ballot, many young people on the ballot that are you know, not just the president, uh, but are all across the place. Christine, uh, Ohio can sometimes be a lonely place for a Democrat uh, to be campaigning. What made you decide uh, to run for the, the, the state house? 
Yeah, thank you for having me. I am running to represent the west side of Columbus because I saw Republicans try to take away voting rights and reproductive rights in Ohio last year. This is out of touch with what Ohioans and people in my community really need. The majority of Ohio state legislators don't look like my community and don't have the lived experiences of my community. It's unrealistic to expect people without lived experiences to legislate in the best interest of Ohioans. I know what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck, and I know what it's like to live with a disability. That's why I want to lead with empathy, advocate for our most vulnerable neighbors, and take concrete action at the State House. And Ash, Jordan, I, I've just I had this discussion with David about the need to focus on state legislatures since so much is happening there from uh, gun safety issues and other issues that are that are crucial. And yet the especially the national media attention is always on Washington elective office. It's always on the House of Representatives in Washington, United States Senate. Uh, what made you aim for the state Senate in Georgia? Well, what I saw was that um, I really wanted to give back to my own community. And what we often see is that the way to make larger systemic change is actually not to start at Washington, but to actually start in your own communities and doing the kind of civic engagement needed to do that kind of work. And for me, um, as David mentioned, I worked in the federal government on election security in 2020, working with states to make sure that our elections are secure. And I saw the important need for more talented folks to go work at the state level. And when I saw that Sean Still, my current state senator, was indicted with Trump for being a fake elector, I realized that someone needed to step up and really show that we're not going to stand for that and that we actually want folks who are going to be working on the issues that matter and not just overturning the will of the voters. Christine, uh, what do you think voters need to know about you and what you bring uh, to what you would bring to that office? Absolutely. I think it goes back to that empathy and being able to advocate for our most vulnerable neighbors. Um, most importantly, the primary election is on Tuesday. I don't take corporate PAC money and I rely on small dollar contributions. If anyone wants to learn more about me and help out in sending me to the state house, you can do so at cockleyforohio.com. And Ashwin, what, what should voters in Georgia know about you and what you would bring to the job? What, what voters should know is that uh, I am from Johns Creek. It's where I was born and raised. I went to public schools here, and I want to really make sure everyone has the opportunities I did. And I would bring a new perspective to the legislature. I'd be the first Gen Z member of the state Senate, the first computer scientist, and the first Indian American legislator in Georgia. But I hope that by playing this role, I'm able to bridge these communities together. I would be representative for everyone, and I want to make sure that we're really bringing the energy, integrity, and unity to make sure that folks from all stripes can really work together on the issues that matter for us. David Hogg, how many more candidates are you working with uh, for state legislative office around the country? This cycle, we're going to be working with 30 across the country. And a big reason for that, uh, Lawrence, is because we want to show that, you know, we can't support every candidate, unfortunately, but the ones that we do, we want to support very heavily. We work on a day-to-day -day basis with their campaigns, whether it's figuring out how to do their door knocking, whether it's how to do call time, and we also financially support the campaigns as well, because that's where a lot of young people need that support. But the real reason why we do this more than anything, Lawrence, is because I believe the greatest threat to American democracy uh, is the hopelessness uh, and apathy that has created people like Donald Trump. And my hope is that when young people look at candidates like Christine or Ashwin, they know that not all hope is lost. And if anybody wants to support that, they can go to leaderswedeserve.com. Thank you so much.